Our next talk will be by Willem Larson um, from Brandeis University. So Willem, why don't you start sharing your screen? Um, and just a little bit about Willem. So Willem received his PhD from Yale Medical School where he studied thermal adaptations found in hibernating mammals. And right now he's currently a postdoc, uh, postdoctoral fellow in Paul Garitti's lab at Brandeis University where he's focused on understanding the mechanisms underlying thermo and hydro sensation in mosquitoes. So take it away, Willem. Thank you. Um, so thank you for that introduction and me to speak today. Um, so I, I figured I'd give a very brief overview on some of the work that I've been doing in understanding the cellular and molecular basis for short range attraction in Anopheles mosquitoes. So I don't think I really have to go into too much detail with this crowd. I think we all know that mosquitoes are a little bit of a problem. Um, they transmit a number of deadly diseases, including malaria, of course. Um, and and the, one of the reasons they're so deadly is that they're, they're very uh, effective at finding hosts. And so to do this, they, they use this suite of sensory cues that exist at different spatial and temporal scales during the host seeking process. So for, from tens of meters away, they can detect elevations in CO2 uh, that, that send the, the females flying and, and uh, seeking further cues. When they get within meters away, females can detect odor and visual cues that further help them home in on the host. And then when they get very close range within just centimeters, heat and moisture become these very critical short range cues that influence these final decisions to land and begin probing for blood. Um, and, and although I've shown it as, as this cartoon glow here, the, the boundary layer that exists around humans is actually a very real physical phenomenon. So with different imaging techniques, um, like the one shown here, you can actually image the thermal plumes that sort of in, encase the entire human body. And so it's really this boundary layer uh, that I'm talking about. If you actually measure the distance at which this occurs, um, in measuring the thermal gradients and humidity gradients coming off of the human skin, you can see that they dissipate by just a few centimeters away. So this is extremely close range, uh, but nonetheless very important for host seeking. So we know a little bit about the cells and molecules that are responsible for detecting particularly the, the long and mid range cues, uh, but the short range cues have remained a little bit more of a, a, a problem. Um, and recently our lab published the first report of a molecule that drives uh, heat seeking in mosquitoes. And it turns out that that's uh, driven by a specific ionotropic receptor called IR21A. Um, but humidity remains uh, very much an open question. These ionotropic receptors were, were interesting to us though, uh, because work from our lab as well as others have shown that in Drosophila, ionotropic receptors are important for driving not only uh, thermosensory behaviors, but also humidity or hydrosensory behaviors. So these ionotropic receptors are invertebrate specific relatives of glutamate receptors. Uh, their structure and stoichiometry is unknown, but it's believed that they function as, as heteromers that are composed of broadly expressed co-receptor subunits like IR93A and IR25A. They team up with stimulus specific subunits like IR21A to drive detection of temperature, IR48 to drive detection of dry air, and IR68A that help to drive detection of moist air. So we know that at least some of these pathways, um, particularly the temperature detecting ones, uh, are conserved in mosquitoes. Um, but we were interested in understanding whether similar ionotropic based mechanisms might uh, mediate the humidity detection uh, uh, seen in mosquitoes. So we chose to focus on uh, one of these broadly expressed co-receptors, uh, IR93A in particular, because the reason that not only would this allow us to uh, test its, its involvement in humidity detection, uh, but but if, if, we, if that's true, it would basically give us an opportunity to knock out all of these modalities simultaneously and, and really give us the opportunity to, to dissect the role uh, of short range cues more generally as it pertains to a, a complex multimodal behavior like host seeking and blood feeding. So to target IR93A, we use CRISPR-Cas9 to make targeted insertions into different regions of the gene. Um, these gave us not only marked alleles, but also gave us uh, genetic access to these IR93 expressing neurons via the QFQAS system. I don't have a lot of time to, to go into the heat seeking behavior, um, but I'd be more than happy to go over it with you uh, later or answer any questions about it. Um, essentially, we initially um, um, used similar heat seeking assays in our IR93A mutants than we used previously in our IR21A mutants. Essentially, you just stick them in a box 
apply CO2. And then if you have two uh, heat plates on the wall, one that's at host temperature and one that's room temperature. And you can see that the, the wild type animals tend to prefer and accumulate at that warm plate. Um, as expected, our IR-93A animals are really bad at this task. So they, they, they fail to uh, accumulate at that heat plate, similar to what we've shown for IR-29. But IR-93A is expressed in more than just this thermosensory scintilla at the tip of the antenna. Um, it's also found, for instance, in the first and second flagellomeres, uh, where you have these relatively unique structures called scintilla ampulacea. Uh, scintilla ampulacea are also known as peg and tube scintilla. And they're, they're called that because they exist in this, this hollow cavern, sort of recessed internal to the antenna, and it's accessed via these narrow tubes that run perpendicular to the length of the antenna. And so within these, these caverns, you have this uh, poreless scintilla that's innervated by two IR93A positive neurons. Um, this has been described for decades using EM uh, images, but because this, this, this tube is so narrow, it's been impossible to get an electrode uh, in to actually uh, record what these scintilla might be responding to. But with our, our uh, genetic access that we have using the QAS system, uh, we can drive genetically encoded calcium indicators and do transcuticular calcium imaging, similar to what uh, has been done in Chris Potter's lab, uh, to monitor the response of these neurons um, when we apply airstreams of, of different relative humidities. So what you can see is that for each scintilla ampulacea, you have two IR-93 positive neurons, one that responds to, to moist air and one that responds to dry air and, and inhibited uh, in the opposite direction. And importantly, um, these responses are completely dependent on IR-93A. So if you do this calcium imaging in an IR-93A mutant background, these responses go away. To get at the, the behavioral significance as far as uh, uh, hydro sensation is concerned um, of loss of IR-93A, we, we, we devise a simple hygrotaxis assay where we have two Petri dishes. We fill one with water, leave one empty. Um, we put a plastic mesh on the top so that the animals um, can, can experience the water vapor, uh, but can't actually make direct contact with the liquid. So when we put these Petri dishes into a cage um, of female mosquitoes, we, we monitor their uh, behavior over uh, an hour and, and see that over time, they begin to accumulate specifically on the water filled tray where the relative humidity level is higher. But if you do the same assay with the IR-93A animals, you get a very different result where the animals essentially, uh, not only do they not care about the dry tray, but they, they don't really care about the water filled tray either. Um, and so this is quite a, a dramatic result compared to wild type, um, but, but one that's nonetheless uh, um, um, based on gross locomotor defects or an artifact of that nature because these IR-93A mutants are perfectly capable of responding to CO2 and other host cues, they'll, they'll take off, they can fly around um, perfectly fine. Um, but what we really think is, is that this, this lack of accumulation at the water filtrate is due to their inability to detect those humidity cues. So essentially then what we have is this animal that simultaneously is defective for heat seeking as well as humidity detection. Um, so these two major short range cues are ablated in these animals. So uh, we wanted to see what the overall effect this would have on host seeking itself. Um, so to measure host seeking, we use a simple hand on cage assay where we suspend a, a, a hand about three millimeters above a cage, so just out of reach of these animals, um, and, and quantify the number of them that are found landing and probing under that hand over a five minute assay. And so a uh, wild type is in blue here. You can see that when you blow into the cage, the wild type animals begin to accumulate quite rapidly under the hand, and they maintain similar levels of attraction throughout that entire five minute assay. And the 93A animals, although they initially begin to accumulate quite rapidly, um, similar to wild type, by the end of the assay, there are significantly fewer of them um, found landed and probing under the hand. And what we see is happening is that although at the beginning of the assay, those 93A animals are landed and probing just like wild type, um, by four minutes post hand exposure, you see a, a very different uh, behavior start to emerge for these guys. Um, many of them have left and are now found flying around the cage, just seemingly in, in search of that hand that they know is there based on the breath and other cues. Um, and then you have a number, number of animals that have seemingly kind of given up and are just resting on the sides of the cage. So it, it almost seems like these IR-93 animals are, are failing to maintain attraction to that hand even over that few minutes that we were testing them. Um, but, but of course, blood feeding is, is, is really when disease is transmitted. So we wanted to see what the effect 
of iron 93 mutation has on blood feeding itself. So to do this, uh, we used uh, an artificial membrane heating system, a hematex system, um, and a collagen membrane to supply pre-warmed human blood and quantified the percentage of animals that ate over 20 minutes. Um, for both wild type, as well as our heat-seeking specific mutants, you have similar levels of feeding. But when you do this blood feeding assay with our IR-93 mutants, you can see this dramatic decrease in blood feeding ability. Um, and quite frankly, they're pretty uh, annoying to grow in the lab because if you, you can imagine an animal that requires blood for reproduction that doesn't blood feed very well, it becomes very difficult to, to keep them alive. Um, but nonetheless, we, we think that this decrease in blood feeding ability is because of their uh, inability to detect some of these important short range cues emanating from this blood disc. So hopefully what I've shown you in this brief overview is that IR-93A mediates not only thermal sensation, but also high grow humidity sensation in Anopheles mosquitoes. And so therefore represents this single gene target that allows us to really dissect the role of short range cues play uh, in, in host seeking. And, and what we think um, these short range cues are doing are providing critical reinforcement um, for providing host proximity information, letting them know that a host is nearby and, and maintaining that attraction as they're, they're searching for that host. And, and in the process also promotes a blood feeding. I'm probably running out of time now, but uh, hope to be on the job market soon, where hopefully I'll have more time to answer some of the interesting questions that I think this work uh, um, leads to, including um, you know, roles for individual iron 93 subpopulations of neurons, um, understanding how some of the sensory information might be integrated in the brain using some of these driver lines that we've created. And finally, um, understanding whether similar mechanisms might be conserved in other blood feeding insects because blood feeding has evolved multiple times uh, in different insect groups. And so with that, I'll, I'll stop and, and thank everyone who's helped with this project. Uh, the Garrity Lab, Paul, everyone in the lab has been incredibly supportive in helping move this thing along um, and, and of course funding um, as well. So thank you. Thank you so much, Willem. Um, so from the chat, we have our first question. So if you start the IR93A mutant, do they show the same level of disinterest towards human on the hand, like on the hand cage experiment? Yeah, so I guess I, I didn't mention it, but but all of these animals are starved overnight. Tonight. So the, the sucrose has been taken away um, overnight the night before. So they've been starved for about 17 hours or so. Um, and the same and with wildlife we haven't done any longer term starvation. Okay, great. Um, do you think that the IR93A may serve in chemo reception? Yeah, I mean, that's an interesting question. Uh, from 80s, uh, it, it seems that it's also involved in, in it's expressed in other uh, locations, um, including outside of the antenna. We don't see any expression outside of the antenna in, in Anopheles, but it is true that you do see some expression in some subpopulation of orco positive neurons um, and, and what the significance is of that we don't know uh, they seem to respond you know just from our gross uh, uh, um, you know broad experiments they respond to, to odors um, from human sense but there might be some um, influence subtle influence of, on, on odor seeking as well great um just yeah. one yeah. more oh it, hey, drew do you have a question well, I was just going to say, uh, uh, Joshua Raji had a had a question in the chat. I'm not sure if you saw that, um, but he, no. he wanted to ask: um, Is is IR ninety three a a a tuning receptor or a co receptor? Because you know it doesn't seem to be as broadly expressed as as the other as the other known co receptors like IR eight a, IR twenty five a, and IR seventy six b. So, it's, what's your what's your feeling here? I mean, I, I would say it's a co-receptor. It's not as broadly expressed as 25A, for instance, um, but it is expressed in multiple subtypes of neurons. It's important for, um, you have the thermosensory, you know, IR21A type cells. It's in these dry responding cells, it's in moist responding cells, um, potentially in, in orco positive neurons. It's, it's definitely in orco positive neurons in, in 80s. Um, so, I, I would say it's a co-receptor, just a less broadly expressed one, which is actually why we were interested in focusing in on IR93A as opposed to IR25A, because IR25A, you'd essentially, you know, presumably knock out similar modalities as well as all of the, you know, um, more olfactory type uh, ionotropic receptor-based signaling as well and, and have like a really messed up mosquito. So, so, so on those lines, do you have any any idea what what the what the tuning receptors might be that are mediating or or helping to mediate this this hyper sensation? 
Yeah, I mean, if it's anything like Drosophila, and you know, my my suspicion is that it probably is. Um, you know, for Drosophila, you have IR forty eight positive neurons and IR sixty eight A positive neurons. Sixty eight A is, is mediates these these uh, moist responsive cells, and IR forty eight response to dry. And so I would imagine it's those two as well. So we have um, um, driver lines that we're testing now to see the try to test the individual impact of those uh, cell populations.